they gave them all pedometers and they very quick, they were impressed about how much these kids were running around of course they found they they'd stuck it on the dog <laughs> and then you've got the example of Volkswagen they were programmed their cars to recognize that they're having a test done and so you go into test mode and cut down your emissions but it's not representative of what that vehicle would be doing out on the roads that's good heart's law isn't it 100 percent Do you remember during COVID at the beginning where the government set themselves a target of 100,000 tests a day and it turned out that they just changed the way that they measured a test and so their definition of a test being done was that it had, it had been put in the post. You could call it gaming, thinking outside the box or even manipulating the system and the likelihood is we've all had a go at some point. Hello and welcome to Sketchplanations, the podcast, where each week we select a sketch from sketchplanations.com that explains something from the world around us. We chat about it and see where it takes us. Think of it as your weekly guided adventure through the forest of facts, across the lakes of enlightenment, around the islands of illumination, over the peaks of perspective, back through the forest of fa- oh, for fa- Who's supposed to be Matt reading, boys? Come on! <laughs> this is basics! <laughs> I'm Rob Bell, broadcaster and son of a scout leader, and joining me once again are senior ranger John O'Hay and, still working on his Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award, it's Tom Pellero. <laughs> Hello, evening. everyone. Hello, chaps. How are we doing? All right? Yes, thank you. Very good. Scouts, DV, Duke of Edinburgh, did any you guys do any of that? I wish I'd done some of that. Me? I didn't. Me too. I didn't do Did you, did you not? I didn't do DV. I did cadets. I did. Ah, that's that. So that's another one, cadets. Yeah, yeah I did. I did cadet. I did the RAF because I thought I'd get a chance to fly planes, and uh, um, we didn't at all. And the army had a lot more fun. And I always and all my other mates seemed to do the army, so I missed out on that. But my son and daughter love scouts, and they do it every Wednesday, so they really, really enjoy it. Mm, yeah, it's good. And John, John, you never, you never did scouts or, or Duke of Edinburgh award or any of these things. No, I was always a bit. I was always a bit jealous of the Duke of Edinburgh mm. going out. It seemed what seemed like going out on cool expeditions. My um, niece recently joined the Air Cadets. Cool. And you get the little waiver for them to sign, and it says, <laughs> "Are you happy for your child to, you know, handle a knife, be out without supervision at times, fly a fighter jet?" And you're like, "Oh, <laughs> that's the sort of thing that goes on in there. It's brilliant. It is brilliant. What you hope for that's what you hope for, is it? But in fact, well, you exactly, and you say that so." My my dad's been in uh, and around scouts uh, for sixty odd years, and he he also kind of is involved in Duke of Edinburgh as well. And the bane of his life is the health and safety oh. that is getting oh. more and more restricted around what kids can do. And because I remember doing scouts with my dad as scout leader, and I mean, <laughs> anything. Went. I mean, it was it was really fun because <laughs> we were doing all sorts. Yeah. It was great. You're attacking, you're attacking your mates with sticks in the woods in the middle of the night. You're shooting fireworks at them. It's great fun. Great fun. <clears throat> yeah. Basically, you're still allowed to run them. I know. I know. <laughs> but the one thing that all, all of this kind of area brings up, in my mind, which is a, a, just a beautiful piece of design and illustration and graphical representation, is maps. Yeah. I think all of those things use maps. Uh, quite key you know the expeditions and the hikes and whatever it is you go on you're orienteering um i love maps i think they're just beautiful documents um i don't know how you boys feel about them i could spend hours john has got one behind him do. i mean look at that he does I, just I, there. yeah that's, there's the world map there but you know we were we were in the lake district recently and just studying all the map particularly like the 3d mountain yeah. maps with all the yeah. contours and stuff lovely They're just unbelievable i'm big i'm a big fan of um edward tufty who's um essentially a professor in information design and he brings up the swiss mountain maps multiple times in his book and just it, it's amazing if you just look at a square of those maps the amount of information the density of information there is just remarkable and the ordnance survey ones in in the uk yeah are the same they're just fascinating you can look at every little shed and yeah. trickle of water anywhere it's, inc- yeah. <laughs> it's incredible if you if you look at archive footage of ordnance survey maps being drawn hand drawn on great big drawing boards big big um and the guys with their rulers and, and different inks and pens and colors it, it's such an it's it's a real skill it's, it, it's an art it is an art it's beautiful beautiful creations you, you can be saved by maps as well right like they yeah they make you go down the right 
valley, that yeah. kind of thing. I was also um, recently, like OS have an app now. Yeah. And the game changing thing for it, obviously, is that it shows you your location exactly where you are on this yeah. map, which is always the hardest thing to do with a map is go, well, where the heck am I? Yeah. So I get I get the picture, but where the heck am I? And so I'm still like dreaming of the time where you could, you know, roll out like a meter by meter map and have a little dot where you mm. are. You know, like the, the Marauders map yeah. in Harry Potter or something. We were watching <laughs> that this weekend with so the kids. Good. And the, the Marauders yeah. map, you see where everyone is and where your friends are. That'd be cool. The, the second best thing about having OS maps on your phone is that you've got all of the maps that you could possibly want right there in your pocket. And you don't have to do that unwieldy unfolding and then it's, refolding it's back on, on the, the page fold, that you it? want. And the wind's lashing across and half of it's down the mountain. Oh, but that was also half that. the fun. Right? I agree. You know, <laughs> built some character. It's a big old map out and you're fighting with it to fold it in the right direction and the rain's coming Swearing in. Swearing at each other. Blowing away. And, uh, nowadays it's like, oh, I've got no signal or I've got no battery. It's sort of yeah. Disaster, Should we keep right? going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I prefer, sure. I prefer a paper map. I'm going to put that out there now. Yeah, Even though it's Luddite. very handy. I am such a Luddite, John. I'm <laughs> proudly. Smashing up your phone. Don't ever hand Rob your phone. <laughs> yeah. Throw it in the toilet. I'll put parts of it on his wall. There's a piano out there. I'm not afraid to dismantle. Uh, Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, and and, and to your point as well, Johnny, countryside maps, especially in mountainous areas where you've got lots of lovely contours and the colours that are used. There's, um, There's another range, or there used to be another range of maps over here called Bartholomew Maps which I think were based on the same data as Ordnance Survey. I think they nicked the data from Ordnance Survey, but they just made their colours more vibrant. Um, we I use those all the time on um, uh, Walking Britain's Lost Railways series I did on telly because they just pop on telly so much more. They're beautiful, beautiful maps. And I always had the um, original uh, prints from them. So they're all from like the 60s and 70s, these maps, and they've been well-worn and well-thumbed. They were <laughs> lovely documents to have with you. Wow. It's really nice. Really history nice. of many walks good expeditions yeah. and and probably arguments as well <laughs> swearing at each other in the rain it's great. trying to get the <laughs> open to the right bit well listeners it's my job to navigate us safely through this half hour or so that we have together thank you first of all for all the correspondence that we've had on email and social media it's it's really lovely hearing all of your own perspectives on the stuff that we cover here on the podcast please do keep them coming in we read every single one of them and we'll pick out as many as we can get through at the end of this episode. We'd also love it if you could follow or subscribe to the podcast. Um, You can like and rate us. All of that really helps us to keep putting these podcast episodes together. Right then, before we get going, please make sure you have enough water with you, as well as all of the things that I put on the checklist that were sent out. I have a couple of spare compasses, but there's not enough to go around. The weather looks fair. Looks like it's going to play ball and stay dry, but do remember... Layers are the key to comfort. Right then, let's get going. This week, we've chosen to explore something called Goodhart's Law, an observation around a trait of human behaviour towards performance targets, observed and formalised in 1975 by a British economist called Charles Goodhart. Now, you'll be able to see Jono's sketch that beautifully summarises this phenomena, Goodhart's Law, as the artwork for this episode on your screens. You can also find it in more detail at sketchplanations.com. Right then, Jono, where did you first hear about Goodhart's Law and why did you think it it worthy of a sketchplanation? Yeah, I first uh, read about it in a magazine article, actually, a science magazine. And it was one of those ones, well, first of all, I'd never heard of it and you mm. know I was in my 30s um and secondly it just immediately spoke to me as very applicable in lots of different areas I think the article at the time and I couldn't find I couldn't find the original was about uber drivers gaming their ratings and actually also having trouble because the company was measuring them on the stars and if they drop below a certain amount of stars then mm. they get kicked off the platform and they didn't like that and so they figured out ways to get stars despite the, the fact um the, the normal ways to get get them anyway so but as soon as you you hear yeah as soon as i saw it i thought you know that's really interesting and you could start to see different places in your life 
uh, in my professional life where this has come up um, and it, over a long, slow and quite important way in many cases. So let's let's kind of nail down what is Goodhart's law? What what is proposed in this observation of human behavior? Yeah, good, so Goodhart's law is really simply put is when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. As a smaller side, it's also a good example of why sketch donations is not really about the sketch. It's about the idea because it's not a great sketch, but it just gets across <laughs> the it just gets across the point so well, and it's been one of the most popular ones that people keep coming back to Is it? because it's such an interesting law. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they've been like shared on reshared on Twitter and yeah, things like it, that. If you put Good Hustle into Google, sketch donation is very top. <laughs> absolutely, the first good. thing you see. <laughs> Well, that's it. I mean, I'd never heard of it before. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's quite interesting. It was a little, little known, I would say. So, what, what is the sketch? Let's let's explain yeah. that. Yeah. So the so the sketch is. Um, it was really when I was reading about it, there were a few examples that were given, and the most common one was this one about I think it was a, a nail factory, and if you got some central planners trying to optimize for getting as much productivity out of this nail factory as possible, they said, okay, well, we're going to measure people on the number of nails that's made. And then, of course, what you get was people delivering thousands and thousands of teeny tiny nails because they all count because that's what you're being measured on. And so they're like, right, we'll change it up and we'll we'll actually we'll measure it on weight of nails because then you can't stitch us up like that. And then, of course, they got a few giant heavy nails, (laughs) which are also no use at all. So that's that's the example. And it's just like it's it's kind of absurd. I'm sure it's fictional, but it kind of gets across the point that, of course, if you're going to be measured on that you're going to figure out a way to make it work for you. And and the, the the phrase that's used a lot about making it work for you is gaming that that target, right? Gaming that um that deliverable. That's a kind way of putting it maybe. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I like it because it comes back to this trait of human behavior because these targets are made for the, you'd build you'd build a target like that for something that uh wasn't sentient, right? For something that is a machine that that can't think outside of the parameters that it's been given whereas we're humans and we're going to try and do the best for ourselves as we possibly can and so if you're incentivized by that target to do something to game it then you're going to do that yeah i think i think the other example that really sticks with you is just making it so clear was about i think it was measuring like fitness of kids in in cities and they gave them all pedometers and they were, very quick. they were impressed about how much these kids were running around because they found they they'd stuck it on the dog and because that's exactly. what you're being measured on so yeah that's it you'll you'll figure out a way to game the measure is basically good heart's law and i think as soon as you start looking around any time that a measure is a target you sort of see that this really does happen and there are loads of examples that I've I've read about that are kind of some of them are anecdotal and others are real examples. I mean, Tommy, have you any any examples that you can think of or you know of uh, yeah. of uh, Good Hearts Law? Uh, yeah, I've got some sort of serious sort of business ones, but kids just make me laugh so much because mm. they are the masters of gaming uh, a rule. I'll I'll never forget uh, watching <laughs> watching tennis. A group of kids playing tennis, and there's loads of balls around, and the coach goes, "Okay, whoever can get the most balls and." bring them back uh, to me wins and one kid just ran straight to the bucket where all the balls were and poured them on the floor and then picked them you know and put basically put the, <laughs> poured them into the shirt. and the whole point of obviously the exercise was the, was the coach wanted the balls picked up and put back not the bucket emptied out into so much shirt. and they were just so chuffed with themselves at this point like that um, it is good. And I've done That's similar good. things with with Jack, you know, in the garden. You're kind of like, right, okay, got to got to show them, teach them grit and help, and you know, help out in the garden. So it's like, okay, well, there's some sort of rubbish or there's bits and pieces around. Jack, you know, how many of the bits of like paper, or, you know, after you've done some building work, so there's lots of bits out in the out in the garden that need sort of picking up, and they're quite close to the ground, so they can pick the bits up. And you go, you know, who can get the most bits? Or you sort of go, well, maybe I can sort of pay them for bits of paper, you know. That... So what they do is they go over and they find a bit, and then they rip it up into lots of little bits. So this is no longer one bit of rubbish; it's now fifty bits of rubbish. And actually, all they're doing is sitting there ripping bits of rubbish up to make them smaller, so there's more. Bits. Look, Daddy, I've made. Look, I mean, like, that's not the point. Three, three hundred quid later, and you've uh, questioned how good a measure that was. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember doing litter picks in secondary school. I don't know if you ever did that. And I, I, 
I do remember them counting the bits of litter that you had to bring back. <laughs> really? And what are you, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, there's there, there's a really good example I think that is is again it's one that's widely written about or spoken about and it was the um, the cobra effect. Did you read about that one? So, and I don't know if it's factual or if it's anecdotal or what, but um, suppose the British colonial government in India in the early 1900s um, decided that there were there were too many loose um, cobras. I was going to say running, uh, <laughs> slithering around the streets of Delhi. Um, so the government if you issued a policy offering a bounty for every dead cobra that was brought in to try and rid the streets and make them a safer place for the citizens of Delhi. Um, and it worked for a while. Until they started and people were cobras. bringing in and they started breeding cobras. <laughs> yeah. And so then the government decided, well, this is, this is not working anymore. So they scrapped the policy. So then everyone who'd been breeding cobras just let them out into the streets because they were a danger to have a, a home. That's 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 the cobra effect. That's one I I read about. I don't, I don't suppose you read about that on the Sketch for Nations website. Did I read about that on Sketch for Nations? Maybe I, I did. I, I don't know. I don't know if you did, but there have is you, a Sketch have you for done Nation it? for the cobra effect. Have you done a Sketch for? Ah, for... <laughs> oh, also one of my. Do you know, know what? I didn't ones. actually. I didn't read it there. I, hmm. I, I think because I, I was thinking of it when uh, when you said about the tennis ball example, Tom. Because you know, like all you want is the tennis balls in, in the bucket. The bucket. And you so you measure that, and they tip them out of the bucket. <laughs> yeah. It's like that is boom. It's, 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 a, it's a great balls, uh, cobras. <laughs> you there, know, there was some. There you was say a, potato. A great example of the cobra effect I heard about um, in Bogota, where they were trying to reduce traffic, and so their idea was that you could um, you could only drive cars with a certain license plate on certain days of the week. Oh yeah. Oh, and so no. you could only drive on Mondays, Wednesdays, this week, and Tuesdays, Thursdays, and next week. And so, so what did people do? They got extra cars. <laughs> they got extra cars. Oh, no. <laughs> exactly. Well, of course you would. Yeah. <laughs> so, some great examples of the of the Cobra effect out there. I mean, often oh, there are no. there are quite awkward ones. You know, like you, uh, quite awkward, like problematic ones. You know, you bring something in to like like get rid of cobras but actually like genuinely to get rid of like invasive pests in a country and the thing you brought in has other effects that you didn't expect mm. but but yeah cobra effect yes well, do you it's fascinating do you remember during covid at the beginning where the government set themselves a target of a hundred thousand tests a day do you remember all that because at the beginning of covid we didn't have enough tests and the government got mm. really sort of punished ridiculed for this and so they were like we're going to get and they put this massive target in and then they somehow managed to miraculously hit it. And it turned out that they just changed the way that they measured a test. And so their definition of a test being done was that it had, it had been put in the post, mm. as in they'd sent a test out. It wasn't the fact that someone had yeah. actually received it or done it. They'd, or done it like, correctly. Or done it correctly. They were like, yeah, we put 100,000 into the post office, into the post box yesterday. So we, we met our target. So. That's not the definition of a test being done. Yeah, it's a good one. The big consequences, isn't it? <laughs> one, one I thought of talking around cars is, you know, uh, CO2 emissions is becoming a measure of how clean or efficient your car is. And, you know, you, you see that advertised loads and loads and loads now because there's, there's quite a lot at stake on it. You know, you're uh, congestion charging in, in big cities, company car taxes, tax bans are based around it. Um, and then you've got the example of Volkswagen and what they were programmed their cars to do, to recognise that they're having a test done. And so you go into test mode and cut down your emissions because some they've got the engine to act more efficiently, but it's not representative of what that vehicle would be doing out on the roads. And I think that is, that, that's good heart's law, isn't it? That's, that's bang in there. 100%. I, I was, I mean, I was going to say like one of the, one of my examples from my life, which we can probably all relate to was cramming f for exams. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, there were definitely some subjects where we got good enough to pass the exams. Yeah. And then literally a week later, I probably couldn't have hardly told, <laughs> hardly told mm. you any of it, um, which Absolutely. is obviously not the intent of the exam. And you're, and you're right. Exams is something that probably everybody or almost everybody has experienced and it is, is, it's not necessarily the best means. It, it's a measure that you can game through cramming and just learning the exam process. Yeah. I think it's a really, really classic example. But then what, what are you supposed to do? Because you're trying to find a measure across a massive population that you're trying to standardise it as best you can. And the, ultimately, the thing that strikes me with exams and with many of the other things that we've talked about here is 
how unfair it can be. Yeah, if you're, I mean, if you're a school and your budget is dependent on yeah. the number of people who pass an exam, then you're mm. going to try and make sure that most people pass it. If you're a teacher wow. and you're, you know, your pr promotion or whatever depends on them passing it, you're probably going to do your best there to get them over the line, even though you know, might think that's not the best the very best use of the time you had together. But I, th I mean, I'm not an expert on this at all, but like there are other, some other ways to do this. And I think, um, you know, some other countries just do st stuff in different ways. There's much lower emphasis on exams, more emphasis on trust, more respect for letting qualified teachers do what they think is best. Um, mm. And using, you can still use assessments as a way of gauging progress and where you are and informing what you're doing, but you don't necessarily have to like have consequences at the end of it. But, but these things are tricky, which is why, which is why good hearts laws is everywhere. And why, and why we're talking about it. I mean, one area that's a little bit meta for the podcast is trying to, trying to get the podcast viewed, uh, listened to as much as we possibly can. And so trying to understand the algorithms that will promote it as much as we can. That's why we tell people to like and subscribe and rate and five star us and follow all this kind of stuff because we're trying to understand the algorithms that will kind of pop that up higher into, I don't know, whatever it is they're looking at, their recommendations that come at them. And is that why you've been listening to it on Spotify and Apple and other <laughs> platforms simultaneously? Yeah, all day logins. from 50 I've got 10 all, countries. <laughs> all my old phones. Yeah. I've got everywhere. <laughs> just, just got it on repeat. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my, like, my music on Spotify, I get, I, you know, uh, I get a tiny fraction every time somebody listens to it. So if I leave it on repeat all day long, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Does it know your ISP? <laughs> Could it not be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. Hay? Very I, popular. I don't uh, think it touches Spotify's <laughs> bottom line. But I think I think the likes of aren't aren't the likes of Instagram and Spotify and Google and TikTok and all this aren't they constantly trying to change or develop the algorithms so that they can be more reflective and so that they're not being gamed as much? In some ways, I think Goodhart's law. Is, is responsible for like ruining quite a bit of our experience of the web. If you, you go back to yeah. like the very original web, which wasn't good, but it was fairly honest. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, Goodhart's Law is partly what gives you like clickbait titles. Yeah. Some yeah. people just click on it, whether or not the article is good or not. And click farms. Yeah, people just clicking on stuff for whatever, you know, emails with like subject lines that just draw you in, even if it's, you know, not great. And I think, um, you know, the original, like, I don't know if you guys were, were doing web stuff this day, but the original like page rank algorithms that Google was doing, right? So search engine optimization, SEO, is all, it, it makes or breaks your business if it's if you're at the top of the list. So mm. everybody's trying to second guess what Google was doing. And they would, I remember the days where you would put, tiny text yeah. in exactly the same color as the background yeah. on the bottom of the page yes. or on the top of the page just so it was on the page because it wouldn't really know and then of course they have to then get more sophisticated and go okay well the See text what you're has doing, to be mate. big the text contrast has to be enough but you know because they're trying to do this and so everybody's like they take one step people figure out way they take another step people figure out way i do have to say generally i think my, like my approach to this and i would do it for the podcast too is mm -hmm. If you make good stuff, things will rise up. Like you should do things in a respectful way. And I've, I've always tried to do it with Sketch Nations. It's probably why it's not a massive commercial success. It's just an interesting project. But, you know, like if you try and just do stuff honestly, I think page rank and stuff like that, well, they, you know, the way they're always trying to just, read, they're trying to find the good stuff. And so I trust as much as possible that they're going to figure out all the people trying to game it and mine go to the top, but maybe that's not the case. And I, and I won, I'm 100% with you on, on this with anything to do anything, not just on the web. So with the podcast, but with, uh, with this podcast, I mean, but also with, with stuff generally, just have trust in what you're doing and tr trust in yourself to do the best that you can. And let that be the incentive and, and have faith that that will rise if it is of decent quality. It, you know, like some some of the guidelines for articles is like, okay, this is how Google ranks stuff. You know, like titles that reflect the content of the article, 
structured titles that help break up your article into readable chunks interesting content that will help people stay on the page longer and you're like that's just writing a good article <laughs> you know? that, that, that's the that's the idea of the whole so in some ways i feel like a lot of a lot of places yeah we've maybe got there but probably a lot of places we haven't <laughs> maybe maybe i'll add in um that that's some interesting things around like trickier things to measure like trustworthiness or if yeah. you're in finance like fraud and so for example if you're trying to assess you know is this a real account and you're trying to use a lot of signals to do it in a way you can't tell people how you're measuring it because if you tell people how you're measuring it yep. people will figure out how to game it but of course it doesn't feel good to not know how you're being measured it feels mm. a bit sort of creepy a bit icky like oh i don't know they're in control and it's all a black a black box but actually the fact is if you said this is how we determine if your account is real or not yeah people will figure out how to do fake ones using yeah. those using those guidelines so it's, yeah. a, it's a tricky thing right now i think that's a tricky thing and f fraud as well like you know bank won't tell you every way that they are assessing yeah. whether or not your transaction is likely to be you know fraudulent yeah because otherwise people will just do all the things that pass all the tests yeah. It's tricky. <clears throat> and often the things that seem to be the things that you should be measuring, you know, like for a business profitability, right? It's the it's the most important bit of a business, how how profitable it is. But profitability is usually led by many other things down the line. And you mm. you can be kind of at your profitable or actually currently, where in the future it's actually the business is not going very well. Do you understand me? So, so for my business, our our lead measures are how many good new products we have coming, and that okay. can be quite independent of actually how profitable we are in any given month. Okay. So it's 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 new products coming that we that we know could be really good ones, and also how many new customers we've got, and it takes about twelve to twenty four months for us to bring on a new retailer, right? So if you are measuring profitability this month. That actually has no gauge really on where your profitability will be in the future unless you start mm. looking at how many new products have you got coming, Tom? What's your pipeline like for new products? And what's your pipeline like for new customers? And those are way away from profitability. But ultimately, that your current profitability. Yeah. But if you're not, but ultimately profitability is the most important bit about a business. So mm. it's, I think, are they called um, leaders? Le leading metrics. Le leading metrics. Thank you, Johnny. I'm rubbish at remembering the, the terms for these, but those are the things. And, and those can be actually really, really difficult to f understand within a business what they are. Um, yeah. But also sometimes they're just bleeding the obvious, right? It's like, oh, yeah, you invent products, Tom. Probably the lead measure is how many new products you've got coming, right? <laughs> yeah. And how well they oh, sell yeah. in the first couple of months. You're like, oh, yeah, that's actually <laughs> really obvious. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Tom, if you, if you keep forgetting, you can always check out the sketch on leading and lagging metrics. On Ooh, Thank you very much. <laughs> leading and lagging. I'm, I'm going to have to make a note of these so that I can uh, include them all. There's, um, there's a really nice um, well, philosophy I, re I really like. I think it's by a guy called Bill Walsh, which is the score takes care of itself, which is mm. um, he's an American sports coach. But it's that, it's that idea. And actually, I really like, like right now, Man City have just won the Premier League in the UK and I wrote Pep, Gu Pep Guardiola as a manager because he when his team loses or draws doesn't do as well as they think he's still very he can be very complimentary of his team and everything that they do because he knows that they're doing the right things yeah. Yeah. such that their overall success will take care of itself and I, I like that idea of the score takes care of like focus on the products that you're bringing out yeah. and profitability will follow yeah. if you're and it comes it comes stuff. it comes back to that trust right it comes back to, to the trust in in the product or the service or the performance that you're giving and that you you need to have ultimate trust that you are doing the best that you can and that that will prevail yeah yeah and uh, and as Jai said it's about having content mm. having the right content and the right the right products the right doing the right thing ultimately all of us is... so, so if you if you if you take that same mindset sorry Tom, is and you and you do the same thing but not for business but for education right yeah which is which was exactly what you said like have trust the score takes care of the the success of the students will take care of itself trust trust the teachers trust the education people who do their job that's kind of what you're saying there isn't it but yeah it is it's it's hard at those big scales to do those things
Yes. Yeah, it really is. When when so much external factors or so many other factors, I should say, are then based on that, like budgets, like your school rating, yeah. like whatever else it might be. Where, 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 um, where I work, <clears throat> like building products on the web, I've seen like a really common one I think that comes up is marketing is typically about bringing people in. And so they're often measured on like leads or signups, for example. Yes. And then product and ultimately the success of the business is obviously those people not just signing up but becoming customers becoming paid customers and, and doing the things on the site and yes. so there's always this little little tussle it's like well, well we're we're bringing loads of leads but none of them are converting you're not bringing the night the right people well but the the site isn't doing its job at converting the right people and 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 so there's always a little back and forth and of course there are obviously there are solutions to that but i think mm-hmm. it's a very common thing it's like okay as we specialize in all these areas, you're going to focus on bringing them in. I brought loads of people in. Yeah, but they were the wrong people. Or no, you're not doing your job when they get there is the problem. <laughs> you know, The course isn't good enough, you know, or the program or whatever. So then for it to be useful, it has to be a combination of all these measures. But then you get into this complexity of of what that that measure is and, and, and how to analyze it. Speaking of complexity, I think, Rob, you're with Vitality as well, right? Yeah, health insurance, yeah. Yeah, and so I think Vitality is a really good example, back to the putting the pedometer on a dog. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, and, and like you said, Tom, the the intent of these things is is good. Like you're, you're tr- they are trying to keep people healthy so that they don't have to fork out money for insurance for medical procedures in the future. And so they, but they have to decide... Like the ones like to decide, you get money off your insurance for safe driving. They have to decide, are you being healthy? And so they do various things, you know, like if you wear a watch, you can count your steps and you get points for workouts and was it mindful minutes or whatever. But then there are rules to those. And I don't know about you, Rob, but every now and then I'm like, I don't know, like, I don't know, it counts a 30 minute workout. So if I'm on 28 yeah. minutes. Yeah. I'll probably walk up the road for two minutes. I, I do the same. I, ju- I just did it tonight. <laughs> I go. just did it tonight. Yeah, and and of course, and of course, you would. But you know, like, you know, was that extra few minutes worth it? Or like, this is where you know people jogging in their living room or something to get over the st- the ten thousand steps. That kind of. Thing. But at least, at least that's good. I thought you were going to yeah, say yeah. so. I so I give my watch to Rob and I let him carry on. That's a good minutes. idea. Well, you, you, you could, could do that. Yeah. You, uh, you could do that. <laughs> you could you could uh, run a business, taking <gasps> everybody's <laughs> watches, everybody's smart watches for their vitality health this insurance. This is brilliant. This so I is don't brilliant. Mean that vitality. No, nor do I. But there, but there's another way. It's <laughs> well, I not... bet there are people doing that. But it, oh, definitely. There used to be a thing where there used to be one. It might have been for Vitality or something else where it wasn't. Uh, it was before they had the complexity of, of linking it to your smartwatch. It was the fact that you went to the gym. So if you if your membership registered on the gym system that you'd gone through the turnstiles, that's it. Cool. You've gone to the gym. Great. Well done. We'll tick you off on your points. Um, I know someone who would go there in the morning uh go through the turnstile or straight out the exit and get in the car <laughs> and take the kids to school <laughs> well, i've done it just gonna pop to the gym i've been there in and out. Oh but then but the other thing with this as well so one of the one of the rewards for being active and this isn't necessarily good hearts i don't know i'll get, I'll get your guys impression on it so with with the vitality health insurance um with the points that that you gain through being active in the week one of the rewards you get is to go to nero coffee and you can get free coffee and you can get whatever coffee you like so i go in and get the most unhealthy <laughs> coffee most expensive and the most expensive which is the one with you know your full fat oat milk uh caramel latte with squirty cream and all the rest Oreos. of it and a large one yeah. i wouldn't do that normally a cake maybe yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah whilst i'm at it <laughs> i wouldn't do that normally i wouldn't go and get that coffee so I don't, I don't, is that is that is that is there an element of good heart's law in that? That sounds a bit more like the cobra effect, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's a bit more cobra. <laughs> <laughs> having heart attacks, and coffee, Been bitten in the neck by a cobra. Yeah, it's it's interesting though, isn't it? All these systems in place, and and we're all guilty. I think I think a lot of people can relate to gaming systems in in some way or another, or or, or measurement systems as. Um, yeah. As is specific with good heart's law. I was when you said about the kids, I, I thought about, I thought about 
it's not it's not a target but you know like we're at the table and they always want to get up and go off around the room and so he's like please stay in your chair and of course then they sit down in the chair pick up their chair <laughs> step to their bum walk around the room because <laughs> that's what you do when you're a kid I'm on the chair and this is this is what what law is like right like the whole of tax law is so blooming yeah. complicated because yeah. you know if you're you make more money as a a contractor than if you're employed so everybody starts contracting so you have to change the rules to close the little loophole yes. and, then, and then some people find some other loophole and that's that's why I like the British legal system is incredibly complex in a, in a way yeah. it's good arts law that's how good lawyers make their money right is finding loopholes I don't know if I'd <laughs> that's, that's yeah. the only value that they provide. That's no, that's um, how <laughs> no, uh, knowing, how, the, how knowing the rules of the law <laughs> yes. is, is part of the expertise of a lawyer. <laughs> Are there ever examples where um, do, you, do you know any law... good lawyers, Rob? You might, you might need to. <laughs> You're going to hear from some. <laughs> Just lock your front door. <sighs> um, yeah, I've gone a bit warm now. <laughs> um, are there? I'm going to change the subject. It's no it's it's yeah. certainly interesting. So I hadn't considered this as something that's happening in the world around us before looking at the sketch and before thinking about it with a bit more detail and talking about it on the podcast. But it's yeah, it's everywhere, and, it, it's, and it's, really it's happening important. all around us. It it certainly is, and it's 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 so enlightening to know that it exists because otherwise you can go about your business thinking yes. you need to make up targets and things and not think through the uh, unintended consequences of them kind of thing and and to be careful and probably needing to understand that you're probably going to need to be dynamic and moving with your targets otherwise they will probably get gamed after a while not moving but flexible like this is not always unless you find that perfect one which might take a few iterations to find it yeah but even then (laughs) once you you think you've perfected it yeah, I, mean, I think you know, as a, as a general philosophy for life, it's nice to it's nice to trust more and measure these things, but don't use them to like force your actions. Just use them to inform and guide your actions. You know, like so yeah, keep track of keep track of how many times you turned up at the gym, but don't get hung up on that being the thing. And you just go to the gym and go to the bar. You know. Is that is That's, that a thing? You have to do a workout. Is that is that maybe a thing that kind of the reason we game these things is because they were ridiculous, as it were. So if you kind of try to impose something really rigid on someone, they will probably just be like, "Nah, this is ridiculous." Whereas if you show trust in them and their ability and work with them to try and make everything better, like then they probably won't be trying to game you the whole time. I, I I see two incentives. <laughs> one is one is personal reward, yeah, and the other is to be bloody minded and make a point about something. But my big take out from this is about trusting in the quality of what it is you're doing, or trusting in the quality of a system that has been thought about in some way that you know justice will prevail, and that anything that is unfair about it, if you stick to your principles, which are hopefully positive, then it should come out in the end. It's it's nicer to live your life that way. Like I agree. N- know all the rules, but but live your life with a little trust. It's funny about you saying about the bloody minded. I was just thinking of it was the vote for player of the season recently, which of of the team we support, and it just it got completely bombed by the uh, local rival team voting for <laughs> the goalkeeper or something. <laughs> yeah. Did it. Yeah. Exactly. Perhaps, listeners, there's something within your control at the moment that's suffering from Goodhart's Law. Again, at work or in your community or at home with your family, as the boys have talked about. Um, and, and we'd love to hear about it, if so. You can send us an email to hello at sketchpalations.com or you can leave us a message or a comment on social media. Please do continue to like, and rate and subscribe to the series because we want to get behind <laughs> those algorithms. We're going to game it, guys. <laughs> No, Don't. we're not. Just trust in we're the process. We're going to trust, trust in the quality and the people, process. If we're saying interesting things, people will subscribe. And in <laughs> and we will trust in the brilliance of our listeners to to keep coming, keep telling their family and friends. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? A bit of both. <laughs> A bit of both. You can't. You can't help it, can you? Why not? <laughs> 
Next week, we'll be talking about our senses, including cross-modal perception. It's something I knew about but didn't know I knew until I saw Jono's sketch and learned the name for it, as with so many different things. It's already up there on Sketchpanations if you want to take a sneak peek. Or you can wait until next week for the podcast, which will be episode 12, can you believe? But with my trusty compass in one hand and an awkwardly folded OS map in the other, the three of us now set off towards the sunset in search of our next adventure. Stay tuned as we go through this week's post bag in just a second. But for now, thank you all very much for listening. Stay well and go well. Cheers. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone. Right, let's get into the post bag. Uh, so this is, well, last week's episode was our quickfire round on sketches we found surprising. We got through 12 of them, boys. We did well there, I'll tell you what. Um, and had an email from Dan who, uh, this was about the owl, the twit to woo sketch, saying, do you ever just hear a twit sound from one owl? Uh, I don't have the answer to that. But um, he... He, he was suggesting that that was the obvious question that we didn't ask in the uh, in the podcast, or or just a twoo. Let's listen out. Yeah, <laughs> let's listen out. Let's listen out. We need a naturist, 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 naturalist. <laughs> sure. Very different. Very different. <laughs> naturalist. Actually, this is also from Dan. He says he loves the idea of a sneeze switch which we talked about um, in the podcast. This was uh, one you brought up, Tommy, about looking up to bright mm. lights in order to help with a sneeze. Um, and he, he he goes on to say in his email that he's also an advocate of the sit-down wee, which was a reference to the uh, keeping one eye um, one eye closed when you go to the toilet in the middle of the Definitely night. Definitely wasn't the topic of the podcast. And too much no, information. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, the idea of the uh, the T-shirts folded in the drawer as the, the kind of filing cabinet, which I've done for years because of the sketch. Um, uh, my girlfriend, she came to me in the week and said, is that why you do that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So that, that was a realisation for her as well. Uh, Jono, we had an email from Niall. Yeah, we, just, we had a, a, a quick note from Niall. He mentioned at the time of the Abla reduplication sketch, which is the one which is about zigzag, flip-flop, um, splish, splish, splash, splash. They yeah. actually shared it with the uh, advertising guru who he, he believes originally coined Bish Bash Bosh. Which is pretty great, isn't it? A chap called Dave Trot, is it? That's right. An advertising guru. Yeah. And there's there, this is off the back of a conversation I was having with a friend of mine um, at the weekend. So uh, she was told she told me that she was sat listening to the podcast about optimism bias a few weeks ago, where the three of us were talking about how we've often gone into things maybe slightly over optimistically, perhaps a bit overconfident of our our chances of success. We we, we went through a number of examples of where that was the case in in our own lives um and and she told me that she was sat there listening to it thinking well no that's that's not how i think at all um and then later on in the podcast when we queried about whether our joint perspectives the three of us on this were perhaps typically male and that maybe a more female perspective would be slightly more measured maybe a bit more risk averse and she said that suddenly she was saying to herself, well, yes, that is me. That 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 is how I operate. So whether that's a male, female thing or just different individual Individuals. perspectives, I don't know. But um, it was interesting to hear a very different perspective on um, on optimism bias. Um, yeah, so loads, loads of correspondence. Thank you very much, guys. But that's it. So um, keep them coming in and we'll be back with you next week. Bye for now. Cheerio. Bye. Cheerio. All music on this podcast series is sourced from the very talented Frank Cinelli. And you can find loads more tracks at frankcinelli.com. <laughs>